All right, guys, welcome to the January version, 2023 version of the Atlanta Radio Club. Uh, we're excited uh, to have everybody with us for another great year ahead of us. And of course, uh, we've got another great program uh, for tonight. As, uh, as always, Rob's done a spectacular job putting these together. And of course, if there's something you'd like to see uh, done uh, presentation-wise for a club meeting, or for a club event, let us know. Let uh, let Rob know, uh, KI4UTY, um, and that way we can put the put the event together or get the uh, get the uh, forum done for a uh, club meeting. Uh, just some quick uh, upcoming uh, things. We've got uh, second Sunday in the park this Sunday at Brook Run in Dunwoody, and of course this is a uh, come out and play radio. So. We usually have a couple of radios out. If you don't have one, that's fine. Come on out. We've got, uh, we'll be able to get you on one. If you've got a new radio or a new antenna you might like to try out or get some help with, bring it to and we'll hook it up and uh, get you going. So uh, join us Sunday, one to five at Brook Run in Dunwoody. Uh, it's just up off the North Peachtree Road off the north side of the perimeter. And then of course, we'll have our club table at the, uh, the uh, GARS uh, Tech Fest at, uh, that will be held at the fairgrounds, and that'll be on the 14th, Saturday, January 14th. Do I have that right? Yeah. And then, of course, uh, at the end of the month, uh, we've got the uh, ARC is going to participate uh, overnight with the uh, Winter Field Day. We're going to be at Sweetwater Creek State Park out past uh, Six Flags, and there's a map uh, available on uh, the Facebook group, and keep an eye out for the uh, group. Uh, .io for an email also that will have all that information in. So that'll be an overnighter. And in case it's going to be a little cold, we decide we're going to utilize the yurts this year. So we'll be able to uh, hide out in some uh, climate controlled uh, digs and uh, not freeze our buns off uh, so easily like we did last year. Well, we had a good, great time last year and a great turnout. So plan on joining us and plan on staying the night. Uh, we're going to have a uh, have some food uh, for dinner that night and uh and a lot of uh a lot of chances to play radio it's a poto park too unfortunately um i know the objective is uh winter field day but uh, there's also the uh, opportunity to do poto but let's let's we'll do more than just poto though it's going to be winter field day and that's the that's going to be the main objective so uh for all you poto guys that's it's your chance to come out and work i think it's k what 2201 or something so uh, join us for that and plan to come out for both uh, both days stay the night uh, bring a sleeping bag or something and uh, if you got time to sleep then then I'm sure you can curl up in one of the yurts there somewhere uh, real quick uh, any updates on repeaters or any info to give us uh, Stephen uh, well the control the new controller is programmed um, I need to upload the DVR files into it, and I'm working with a cable vendor called Northcom to build the cables that we need. The big hang-up is that it's kind of an octopus cable that we're going to have to have, but I have confidence that they can do it. I just don't know what the cost will be, so we are, uh, we're just waiting on that at this point. And that's basically it. Are we doing something, Stephen? That why do we have require a custom cable? Because it's the port expander into the controller is kind of complex because it's got both logic signals that turn the ports on and off and audio signals that go through it. And they go to two different places on the controller. And uh, the controller company doesn't provide a cable for that? No, most uh, most repeater controller companies don't provide cables. Okay. Or at, or at a reasonable price. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Stephen. Uh, thanks for the um, report on repeaters, and thanks for the work that you do to keep them up and running. Um, all right, well, I'm going to go ahead and... Uh, turn it over to uh, our handsome uh, young uh, programs uh, chairman, Rob, KI4UTY, for tonight's uh, program. Yeah, he can't make it, so I'll do it. <laughs> um, good evening, everyone. Um, hi, Claude. I didn't say anything earlier, but thanks 
Thanks for <laughs> thanks for being there. Um, yeah, tonight's program is is about parks on the air, which a lot of people have been asking about um, for a long time. It seems to be a, a popular program that's getting more popular. Uh, you know, you get to operate outside in a state park or a, uh, I guess it's a federal park, right? We'll, we'll hear all about that. And I've got an expert lined up th through the courtesy of Zoom. You know, we get to, uh, we get access to people, you know, outside the Atlanta metro area, although some people would say Athens. He's, he's over in Bulldog territory in Athens. And uh, um, he was, he comes highly recommended. Uh, by somebody who I trust, and I've heard I've heard good other things about you from Claude from other people too, and I'm sure that uh, um, I'm going to find out very um, very soon that uh, confirm that they were right. So um, without further ado, let me just go ahead and we'll get this going. And it's uh, Claude Ray AC4SH, and uh, talking about POTA parks uh, on the air. Um, over to you, Claude. Let me share my screen now. I guess I'm still showing up on there too. Look okay? Looks good. Great. Well, hey, thank you for inviting me, Rob. And glad to do this. Never have done a Zoom presentation on POTA before, but uh, been pretty familiar with it lately. Let me just go ahead and move along here. I figure out how to move my pointer. Oh, uh, there we go. Okay. So this is what I gave Rob as a blurb to send out there. What can reinvigorate us to get back on the air, get new hands and uh, change modes, operate Morse code. I mean, a lot has happened since I've been in POTA. It didn't take a protracted campaign by ARRL, but they actually did help. The parks on air has really made a big difference. Let's see. You gotta get rid of this on there. We gotta get rid of that. All right, now I can see what I'm doing. So that's me in the summertime, apparently. Uh, with my newest little toy there on the table, KX2. Uh, but as you see, I was licensed back in 92. I was a no-code tech. When I heard, I followed ham radio for a long time. And then when they came out with the no-code technician license, and I was of that age, you know, then that, that having a little more time to work with things, I went ahead and got that no code tech license and quickly found out that I di didn't get what I wanted. I wanted to talk around the world. I wanted to be able to uh, chase DX and all that sort of stuff. So quickly within a few months, I was upgraded to extra and through trials and tribulation, uh, passed no code. I mean, I passed 20 word code. So that's what I did pretty fast. I was in the National Guard for 41 years. Besides growing up in the family car business over in Elkton, if you ever heard of a command sergeant major, tell me what they do, because I can tell you what they shouldn't do sometimes, too. Um, when I first got started, packet radio was fairly new back in the early 90s, and I had a lot of fun with that. And uh, when I heard about DX and I started chasing DX, I had to put a tower up in the backyard and a tri-bander and uh, enjoyed chasing DX, even had a 160 meter loop in the backyard over and over and I had a little more real estate than I do here. And that's pretty pretty fun. So when I did field day for the first time, got to call CQ, I found out what it was like to be on the other end of the pile up, to actually have people calling you. And that's what got me started. But in 98, six years after I got my license, moved here to Athens and into the HOA. And besides having antenna restrictions, it also brought a lot of uh, uh, RFI from the local area. So I didn't do very much with ham radio, but think about it and follow it and try to keep up with it until June of 2020 at the start of the, a real pandemic and had some leftover repeater equipment from Elberton, decided to sell to a local club here in Athens and Jess Hickey, M4JH, points at a Wolf River coil sitting over in the corner. I said, what is that? And he said, oh, they use that for parks on air. And I said, hmm. So like anybody nowadays, just pull out Google, look it up, and next thing you know, I started doing it. Chased a few from home, but then mainly just figured out it's not that hard to be an activator. So two and a half years later, over 500 activations, 30,000 QSOs down with parks on air, 
And I, I decided then I'm going to take that next go to go to all 203 of the POTA sites in Georgia. I've done a few outside the state. But I'm down to uh, four left to go, and they're down near Savannah. Uh, that was as I actually went to Wolf Island and Blackbeard Island with the help of a buddy who lived down at Darien back then. Wow. And if anybody has questions as we go, I'll be glad to talk to them. I can't see you so much as you can see me. Hopefully you still can anyway. But I'll talk a little bit about the program now. It started here in the U.S. and it's all over the world now. Uh, hunters, like I mentioned before, that's somebody that sits and waits for somebody to go to a park. And they they try to get in touch with anybody that's in a park. Activators the guy that's in the park or girl, uh, call in CQ mostly, and the simple rules are you go to a valid park. You mentioned earlier, John, it's got to be, or maybe Rob, a national or state park. It can't be a, a county park to be added to the list. There are a few exceptions, and when it comes to my heart state park over in Hartwell, it dropped from a, a state park to a county park, but they don't take them off unless they just completely close. You can't use repeaters except for satellites, pretty much like field day. Uh, you have to operate anywhere in the park, whether you're in your car, walking around on a trail, or sitting at the park bench like I am down there at the bottom picture. The exchange, the minimum exchange is the other station's call sign and a signal report. We don't even have to send in the signal report, but you do need to know the band that you're operating on in the park that you're in. But, Mainly, make sure you hear somebody's call sign. It's good to get the state to, to make it a, an official activation of a park. The activator has to have 10 minimum contacts in that UTC day. Logging is done by the activators. The hunters often will log the contacts, but for them to get credit, the guy that's in the park, that's the activator, has to submit the log. Wish I could remember where that map was from up there, but uh, it's a nice service called QSOMAP.org where you can plot your contacts from any one park. You see it's pretty much centered on Northeast Georgia where I am. A lot of people say it's the fastest growing outdoor ham radio hobby. I think it is too. So this is where it started. Uh, even before what we think of as the beginning, worldwide flora and fauna started to draw attention. They they there's another group called Flora and Fauna Nationwide or Worldwide, but Flora and Fauna is actually the radio program that, that was going then. But in the 100th anniversary in 2016 of the National Park Service, ARRL, this is where they kicked in there. Sean Kutzko was the uh, contest manager and he came up with the National Parks on the Air program. It was a big hit. People went out to parks. There's one right there in Atlanta. Uh, uh, MLK Memorial is a U.S. park. There's a couple more around uh, the state. But after MPOTA ended in 2017, everybody was still had the rush of wanting to do something like that. So a group of hams here in the U.S. took it on as the KFF, which is the way flora, flora and fauna works. They, they go by WWFF for worldwide. And the first letter designated becomes that for the United States. So K was for U.S parks. And it lasted for a little while, but then they apparently didn't get along or didn't have the same ideas, and they split off and made parks on the air in 2018. Of course, many of you probably have heard of summits on the air, islands on the air, U.S. Islands Awards, lighthouses on the air, caves on the air, who knows, it's a lot of other programs, but Boulder is the one that has really taken off. And as you see here, there's more than 10,000 sites across the US and Canada. At this point, this was June, 2020, there were more than 538,000 QSOs, and that was in the year. Um, and they have this 1,500 plus registered users. I think it's way more than that now. Now 770,000, just did this for a point of perspective. The 770,000 ham radio operators licensed in the US, but we all know that once somebody gets a ham license, often they're not very active. So I would guess what maybe 10% of those are truly active hams, that'd be 77,000. 
that makes sense when you look at this chart. Out of that 77,000, let's say, in the year 2022, you see the activator number grew to 6,749. And hunters were 23,372. That's a big piece of that 77,000. Even as of uh, was it yesterday, the 4th, that morning, there were already 1,104 11, activators already on the air that, you know, in 23 and 6,250 hunters. And you see the big number of QSOs out there. That's the most for any person. That's not for the total count. That means that somebody had made 122,000 QSOs last year. And also you see the numbers of parts that have been activated. The part numbers have even increased as they've gone worldwide too. But most of that's more and more parts being activated in the US and Canada. And who are those folks doing POTA? Well, like me, who had been active for, gosh, what, 20 years and found out about this and uh, enjoy it. But there's, I've met a lot of new hams that participate in, like our field day, we're going to have at Watson Mill Bridge, which is another POTA site. We'll get uh, POTA credit for everybody that signs up over there as an activator. And that has stirred up a lot of interest just in the small town of Athens. Uh, a lot of techs now realize if they had HF privileges, they could get a lot more POTA contacts, whether it's from hunting at home or going to the parks and activating. And of course, family and friends that go out with us to park activation. I've seen a lot of husband, wife, and family uh, kids that have gotten their license and become active. There's a fellow I can't remember called signed up in Tennessee that I've talked to several times. And his two sons, one's 12, one's 14, they get on the radio every time he activates. Uh, Claude, can I ask you a fast question, Rob? Please do, yes. Um, maybe when you said that the, uh, you know, the techs who upgrade to HF are, you know, are, are joining the program. Yes. What about, what if you're a tech and you're with a control operator, you know, so that you have HF privileges, but you're still a tech Can you log your contacts and does that count? No, it does not count. They had to operate within their privileges. They can operate the microphone under a control operator, but the control operator gets the parks on the air credit. It's, they do get the thrill and excitement of working a pileup. Uh, and they and actually a technician can get POTA points. They, they can qualify, but they have to be within their license privileges. So you could go to Kennesaw Mountain like I did a few months ago, stand up there on the marker at the top with the HT in your hand and make eight or 10 or 12 contacts pretty fast. Thanks. Did I get it right? You did, thanks. Okay. Now, uh, I think it's cool, and this is really my more my opinion, but it has, it's easy to find. It keeps things moving. You don't have to worry about it. And, and the deal I got about not like VHF and UHF comes to mind when I remember somebody gets their ham license and wants to talk to somebody on the air. They key up the repeater or get on simplex and they get dead air, nothing going on. And uh, that happens on HF sometimes too, when you, you try to call a CQ and nobody comes back to you. Uh, it's not that way with POTA. When you go to a park or when you go to hunt, you're going to have somebody on the other end of the microphone or key or computer screen. One condition here is the quiet RF at the park. That, for me, that's the thrill of going to the park. Uh, when I first got my photo hunt, uh, activation station set up, I had a lithium iron phosphate battery sitting on the desk, running my HF rig, and I'm putting up with S5 noise level from all the stuff around my house. And Georgia Power decided to cut off the power for about five minutes. So it got completely quiet. I thought my radio cut off. I looked up there, it's still on. And I'm hearing stations that were there that I couldn't hear before. So it was a big blast to be able to get that. And of course, it gets you outside. You get to enjoy the, the nature. And I've, in my quest to get to all the parks in Georgia, seen a lot of parks in Georgia, parts of Georgia that I would not have seen otherwise or hadn't in a long time. And it's simple, easy rules. You get a lot of recognition. And I'll go into some of that recognition in just a moment. This is some of the social media pages that Parks and Air is available on. And uh, even as a Georgia Ham Radio Portable Facebook group, if nobody signed up on there, I, I know the administrator real well for that one. 
and I don't mean to keep running on. If somebody does have a question like you did, Rob, please chime in. I, I do have a pause plan in just a moment, but hey, it helps me understand what your questions are too. So like I said before, hunters make contact with activators who are in the parks. A hunter can be in a mobile. I had a lot of mobile contacts when I'm at a park. They can also be portable at another park or anywhere they want to be on the AT. I've talked to a lot of hikers. And of course at home, you get a big antenna and a, a linear sometimes it helps a lot there too. Um, you have to do a complete exchange. You know how frustrating it can be when you hear somebody say Sierra Hotel and they never give you the Alpha Charlie Four. Well, you know, you can't make it from there. And hunters have to find the activators and make contact, which is not very hard to do, but you just gotta do it. Activators, the ones go out to the park, set up there in the park, call CQ, get the and give the complete exchange. But now park to park contacts is kind of a special feel there. That's when an activator in say uh, Watson Mill Bridge State Park contact somebody at Sweetwater Creek and hopefully they'll do that on winter field day. That would count a special category for parks and air. Of course, the activators still be, has the one that has to file the log, or the, even if you have frustrating two or three uh, contacts and you say, ah, it's a busted activation, you still need to turn it in because that hunter expects to have gotten credit for that part. But now let's look at awards. This is the one that catches a lot of people initially. Somebody that first starts on parks and air is going to qualify for awards very quickly. It's for the number of parks they've activated or hunted. I think it starts at 10, but it's, it's something like that, which is a real blast get a certificate that you can download and do what you want to, show it to people, put it on your Facebook page, print it out and put it on the wall. Uh, there's DX awards. It's this, this one actually category started fairly recently. I think I've only got an award for maybe 10 or 15 DX contacts. Believe me, it's a blast though to have a, uh, a DX station call you when you're listening for U.S. call signs and Sierra Papa or Italy Kilo or Oscar Hotel shows up on the prefix, uh, you got to stop and think about it a little bit. And then unique references, how many parks you've been to and uh, rovers when you move from park to park in a certain amount of time, there's a lot of detail to that. And of course, you see one of my working on is uh, the geographic awards for work tile references as an activator. So I'm close on that one for Georgia. Repeat offender, like somebody goes to a park for it's 20 times as the base level. I've been to Sweetwater Creek over 20 times, so I probably have an award for that. Operator to operator. So that's when first guy sent me one call sign was November 3, X ray Lima Sierra. Joe, uh, and I didn't know we got it, but I knew I contacted him a lot of times, but Parks on Air awarded him the Hunter Operator Operator Award. Park to Park Awards, you see, start where you have Park to Park contacts over 25 times. And then there's a list of special awards in there, Support Your Parks events. It's every quarter there's one of those, Support Your Park program up for a week. Uh, outstanding Operators, it's like, like a lot of other awards, you have to be recommended for that one. Six meter six pack, I hadn't got there yet. I'd only got about four six meter contacts on part, but that's the first four six meter contact I ever had too. M1CC is, you know, I don't really know completely all that. Somebody may chime in. Do you know, Chris? Oh, you checked in, okay. Um, yes, uh, sir, that's uh, that's 10 bands on 10 different parks. The okay, MC, so 10 uh, M1CC. 10 for, all right, yep. I, thought, I figured you knew that one. Well, thank you for being there too. And I got my Outstanding Operator Award today. You sure did. And Chris, AE4XO is on here, and you may have seen that mentioned. Chris, tell them just quick what you did. Um, okay, real quick. Uh, after a park activation, I, ha I helped uh, somebody up in North Carolina that did not have some cell phone service. And I got, uh, got uh, in contact with the hospital in Murphy, North Carolina, um, to tell them that they were uh, bringing an injured person to the hospital. When they got to the hospital, the staff was standing at the door uh, waiting for them to get there. And so that was uh, basically it. So you maintain HF contact with the, the camper who was yep. had, had the uh, injured person leaving the area. Couldn't talk yeah, the there was, yeah, yeah, the ham was, the ham had stayed behind with the with the campsite and then 
his friend who had gone with the injured person to the hospital and it took him about an hour and a half to get there from where they were staying in North Carolina. Yeah. And so then, uh, that, then that person ended up going to Chattanooga for surgery. So it was a, a severe hand injury um, that they had. And so it's really, uh, yeah. really neat that you could do that. And I think the idea of having parks on air contacts going probably would, would have really gave that uh, the guy in North Carolina something to call for because otherwise you don't hear much activity on HF all the time. Well, thanks, Chris. Uh, and I've got New Year awards highlighted because every New Year for the first weeks you get awards for either activating or hunting. You got to activate, you got to have full activation, 10 contacts from a park or a hunt one park. And so this is what it looks like. It's a pretty neat looking award. And all of them have that kind of appearance right there. Uh, Jason Johnson, W3AAX, is one of the, is the CEO of Parks on the Air and was a big mover. He was back there with uh, KFF when they first rolled over from the WWFF. He's got, um, the, oh, go ahead. He's got the date wrong in the lower right hand corner. <laughs> you know, I ran the wrong way. That's not, I'll have to call Jason and tell him about that. They got 23 in there twice, but you know, that may be back to the first one I got. And that's why they do a lot of these awards because that would have, that would have correlated. Eh, oh, well, it's still pretty anyway. How do you get started? Well, that's the next part of this presentation. Yeah. Well, I guess it's not. Okay. Let me see if I got that better. Yeah, I guess that didn't work right. Well, let's see if I can back up. Um, there it is. What I want to do is show, and I will get to how do you get started with this, but if you are, want to hunt a park or you want to do park to park, I hope you can see this well enough that I got it circled. You can, this is a spotting page. It's under pota.app. It's not a app, it's actually a web address. And you can sort it by frequency like I have. And you can maybe able to see the frequencies down through here. And this is single sideband only, but you can have it completely open so that it's sorted by time. Sort you can have the different modes, digital modes or uh, CW, whatever you want to have in there. The next one is, this is the card view. And so if you want to see it in a different way, you can present it that way. And if you see one that you want to get and you want to know a little bit about who KO4PWQ is, you can click on his name there and show a little more information about that. So, oh. And to find parks, look there, John, I actually put Sweetwater on the map. I was lucky to work out that way. But this is a, a piece of the map that you can go to and you can have it come in local to your location or you can select where you you know look for it. So in this case I decided to take uh, Sweetwater Creek as one to uh, focus on here but you see there's another one top left uh, that's Kennesaw Mountain the MLK Memorial's dead center in Atlanta almost and over there at Stonecrest is Arabia Mountain and uh, Panola Mountain State Park. You click on that little yellow dot, you get this page here. First off, it shows you more information. You've got a nice spot for the, uh, can you see my cursor? Maybe not. Well, yes. maybe not. Okay, in the center of the screen in the green highlight is the web address that you can get more information on that part. And um, if you go further down that page, you can also see who's activated it, how many contacts have been made there, that sort of thing. Uh, there it is. Tell you a little more about that one. And that's where I want to get to. Now, let's stop and see if there's any questions or how long have I gone. I don't want to run you up to less than 25 minutes right there. I have a question. Sure. Okay. <clears throat> I heard that if a state park is run by a private company, it cannot be classified as a POTA park. Example, Stone Mountain Park. Is that true? Yeah, sort of, kind of. It's, you know, some of that verbiage is not quite there. As far as I know, um, Stone Mountain, I couldn't find any record of it being a, a state park. I always thought it was until I got involved with parks on air. If it was something different, let me know. But now it is uh, operated by a private corporation completely and not owned by the state. And the reason I went and did so much research, because I'm trying to get all the parks, 
But the other thing is about two years ago, I volunteered to assist with the mapping in Georgia. And the fellow that I asked was a mapping manager. He said, I've been wanting to get rid of this job anyway. You want to take it on? So I've been doing that too. See, I thought it was owned by Georgia, state of Georgia. I could not find that. And I wanted to, I really did. I'd like for it to be. But even if it was, the property was owned by Georgia. It's not operated by Georgia at this time. Yeah, that's so true. So to qualify park at, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's true. That's what yeah. I'm saying. I have another one that I wanted similar that is fairly new, but um, the hike in up above Amicaloa. It's a separate property from uh, Amicaloa State Park. And it is owned by the state. I know that for sure. But it's operated by the concessionaire and not by the state. So all those employees are concessionaire employees and not state employees. So it's a little different. I really see, didn't want to include that. And that's interesting because Georgia Veterans State Park is managed by Lake Blackshear, but they have they have state employees at the front gate. So when I called these like, reserve the the picnic thing, I had to call Blake Blackshear Corporation. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. but the state employee was at front up front taking the money that day I went down there. Yeah, it's a funny mix, but state I suppose found out it's a better uh, efficient system to let a concession run the lodging and the golf courses at those parks, but uh, but that, that does happen a lot, you're right. Okay. Do uh, I have any other? Thank yeah, you. For, further question about that. If you if you want to find out whether or not a park is uh, okay, where do you look? Okay. Um, oh, well, the park map that you can pull. Let me see. I may have a slide that shows that. Um, but when you go to the POTA.app, POTA.app, uh, you're going to be presented with several things. One is the choice to, to pick the map or to look up a park at the top of the page. Uh, let's see if I can find it back there. Yeah, in the center there where it says search for call signs and parks up here. You can start typing in a a park name there. If you were to type in Amicalola, the first few characters went until it becomes unique, they'll start pulling up uh, information. And you'll pull one of those lists like we had over here uh, that will show the park name or number name and uh, some information about it. And also down at the bottom of that page is some notes where you can find out a little more. But if you ever have any doubt, uh, Get in touch the park manager. I mean, the uh, map manager for the state. And again, that's me. And I got a QRZ address that you can pull up anytime to email to. Also, there's plenty of help on online. Um, those numbers, like 2201, that's a POTA assigned number? It, indeed, it is. There's a long list of them. The K is, again, just like the KFF, that's a U.S. park. And then they're sequentially done when they when they first put in. So if you look at the state parks, you'll see they run in the 2000 range for a long way, and then they start jumping as they add them on. It's not a requirement. But that's what when I'm doing a park activation, I'll be calling CQ Parks and Air CQ Poda. This is Alpha Charlie Four Sierra Hotel at Kilo Two Two Zero One QRZ, and so that's the designator. Of course, there's also a spot page that people can look and find me on, like we're showing over here. Well, maybe not. Okay. All right, let's go a little bit more unless somebody's ready to stop. More. Right, this is yeah. How many do people activate from cars often? I, I did hear that at the King Center, you know, the feds would not let <laughs> would not let uh let the people operate from the uh you know, from the street or from the building so they just sat in the parking lot and they operated that, the that's, that's and where i did uh i did have been up there twice um i've got a, a drive on mount uh 30 foot pole or 23 foot pole whichever one i bring and i've got some uh two and a half pound barbell weights that i use for my guys i put an inverted v up both uh, one time it was a wolf river core other time it was inverted v but um, I did sit in the car because it's not any park benches. And I was in a part of the parking lot that was out of the uh, traffic pattern. 
And the second time I did it was on MLK Day last year, which was kind of fitting, I thought, to be there at that park. But yeah, there's, every park has its challenges. Yeah, so the feds were okay with that and then the uh, park service? The ones I talked to were because I didn't talk to any of them. And, and yeah, there's the a, a, lot, a lot of discussions about, you know, the whole thing about asking permission or, or uh, begging forgiveness. Well, most of the time, people at parks do not care. They don't understand what we're doing when we go there. They just don't want us to interfere with somebody else's uh, uh, enjoyment of the park. So like when I, I was in. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Oh, uh, what I was saying is I made sure when I pulled up the MLK site that I, it wasn't so overcrowded even on MLK day last year that I would be anybody's way. Uh, I made sure when I positioned the antenna, it wasn't gonna trip anybody up. And uh, I stayed there quite a while. And that's about it. What were you gonna say, Chris? Oh, I was just going to say, I went down to Jimmy Carter um, a couple of weeks yeah. ago, and I made the mistake of asking the the ranger if I could put an antenna up, and she said yeah. since it was a holiday, um, she couldn't <laughs> get a hold of the person to give that approval, so I just went out, and I did my hitch mount and put my pole, my 30-foot mast on the, on the hitch, and it was no trouble, so, you know, you have to be prepared for you know, alternating your, your, you know, um, your setup, because sometimes you have a tree, you can use a tree. Sometimes they'll let you put stake in the ground. Sometimes they won't. And so um, it's good to have uh, multiple ways to, to put your antennas up, um, especially when you have things like that, where you can't do, um, do that in certain places. Yeah. I tell you what, this is a good time to go to the next part. We, we, uh... There are a lot of rules and the most of the common sense that Parks and Air has. You saw the spotting page, it has the same green heading that this page does there. But now I've clicked on the sign up button over there and it gives you this create a cognito account. Well, that's where you get ID. And some people use pictures on their account or not. Anyway, you need to go through that first. The next page you get was this one right here where you do the sign in. You can use any of those social media accounts or set up an account. Actually, in my case, the one in, I use, the Facebook sign-in, actually my email address, my Gmail address is down there on the bottom right. And I did that to set up an account for the uh, Athens Radio Club so I can flip-flop between the two right there too. But if you hadn't had one before, you go ahead and set it up right there. And then you flip to this page. After Create Cognito, you go to Rules and Code of Conduct. And that covers a lot of what we're, we're just talking about, where to set up and what to do uh, if there's a conflict, use it. The thing is, if there's a conflict, hang it up, go it out of there and figure out what you did, how you're going to activate the park next. But that brings me to another point. I've seen this brought up. How do I activate? Chris, you may have seen this too, but there was somebody recently that said, well, I went to ask about activating and they didn't know whether I could or not. You know, it, that happens sometimes. But if you don't know and you want to go to a place that you hadn't been before, there's always a listing of who's activated there before. Send them an email, get in touch with them and say, what did you do at this park? Where did you go? What was the best way to operate? Because, you know, I, a lot of hams are like me. They'd rather tell you something than uh, have you figured out yourself, but it's always there too. Uh, the FAQ is coming from some of this and I've got some of that later if we get to that. Uh, acknowledge community resources. I think I've got a slide for that. There it is. Uh, that's the community resources right there. This listing of things that you can use to find out more about Park from there. And that guy, who's that guy down at the bottom? Anybody know his call sign? His name is Matt here. He's one of the guys that's made, way better than me at being an instructor. And he's got an interesting call sign. It's November 3, November Whiskey Victor. And he always, he nobody ever gets Whiskey Victor. He said, not West Virginia. Matt does a great series, and it's not just that one slide, uh, PowerPoint there. He actually will uh, cover a lot of topics. Let's back up, see if I missed anything. In the wait for approval, it rarely takes very long at all. And they'll send you a note said, you're good to go. And if you've ever chased POTA, hunted POTA in the past and hadn't set up an account like this, when you, when you do create your account, and uh, you're approved, if you go and look at the awards, you may be surprised you already got some. Because you chased me, 
I turn in a log with your call sign on it, and you might find uh, that you actually already have some credits going to your name and get on the air. That's the main point, right? So that's the things about the code of conduct, common sense right there. Uh, and so now, where are we? Uh-oh, Skip, what did I put on there? Yeah, go for it. <laughs> okay, might as well. Georgia State Parks in the air. Has anybody heard of that one? Chris, you don't count. So April 1st and 2nd, 2023, the week before um, the Georgia CUSO party, we've got 50 state parks identified that are also POTA sites. And we will have a, an event to activate as many of those as we can. We're about this close, this close, to having the website ready so people can go in there and sign up. What'd you say? Any any questions about that or ideas? I do have more slides. We have to, but it's up to you guys. I'll be glad to add your question because that's really thinks I think I can get more out of that than uh, anything else. Um, I've got a dumb question. Um, question. Just for a summary, because I'm just trying to follow this. Uh, I guess we're all trying to follow it, or someone doing better than I am. So you're a. Uh, the different ways you do it. Would you? You're an activator. You you register as an activator, and you're an activator sitting in a park, and then you are talking to hunters who are calling you, and the hunters can be, they can be in a park or they can be at their home, but it's, um, it's an activator getting you and you're calling CQ and then the uh, hunters are responding. Is that correct? Have you ever worked DX or, or had a pile up you tried to bust into? No, just, just when you set up in the park, the, uh, you're, so you're, you're an activator. You're not talking to people who are not enrolled in the program, for instance. If I hear someone on the air and they're in the state park program, you know, I mean, they're, they're calling POTA since I'm not a registered hunter, I shouldn't try and get them, I guess. So that's, I absolutely that's right. do get them. If you hear somebody calling CQ and you want to talk to that guy in Nevada, answer his call, he will still get credit for it. You'll get credit for it too as soon as you register with Parks and Air. When you register, you register for all of it, hunter and activator. You don't ever have to activate. Uh, I guess you don't ever have to hunt, but most people do. Uh, but yes, please do answer the call. If somebody calls me when I'm at a park and said, there's a net starting up in 10 minutes, what do I do? Well, if you didn't identify the first time, I want to say, hey, this is AC4SH, what's your call? He's going to be one of my contacts because I really did it, what I'm supposed to do. And then I'll talk to him. I had this happen just a couple of days ago on the first. Um, I felt a real nice guy came on and said, you know, in about 12 minutes, we're going to have, we traditionally have our 40 meter net about one KC away from where you are. And he was really nice about it. And I said, okay, well, hey, I'm calling for parks on the air. I can move on pretty quick, but what's your call sign? I appreciate you letting me know. And of course he told me and he's very gracious about it. I said, well, I'm gonna put you down as a contact. Hope you don't mind, it didn't matter, but I was gonna do it anyway. And uh, we talked a little bit about, so I took an educational opportunity to tell him a little bit about it, but I've had that happen a couple of times and when I start back, usually the other hunters will back off for a minute and let the activator talk. And uh, often I've had that uh, person that helps say, man, you got a big pile up because they hear so many other people calling. The most, and Chris, you may have had better, the most uh, contacts I've ever had in about an hour and a half, two hours was 222, one, one activation. And it can be a real flurry of activity. So yeah, bust in there, see what your station will do. Yeah, is that answer, answer your question, Rob? Um, yes, it does. The uh, I, I have a uh, follow up that I'll that I'll think oh, of, yeah. but yeah, that 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 definitely answers it. Thanks. Okay. Well, anybody else? 
Um, I'm Michelle Moore, uh, Kilo Delta Two, uh, Mike, Zulu Michael Victor. This has been a great presentation. I'm really enjoying it. I'm a new ham. And my question is, what frequencies, can you talk about frequencies that uh, you mentioned six meter um, that we should be focusing on and using? Class license do you have? Michelle? I'm sorry? Oh, what, what's your license class? Um, I've just achieved um, general, but I'm still very new, and I've just recently gotten my first radio. So um, I have a lot of um, educational deficiencies I need to address very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, this is a photo. I'm going to flip back real quick to uh, the spotting page. And uh, that's where you know where people are. If you're at home and want to chase a park, uh, you see down here, the third column, it's got frequency in there, sure, okay. right there. Hmm? And that's in there. You mentioned six meters. Six meters, because the way it operates, doesn't usually generate a lot of activity unless the atmospheric conditions allow it to do. But in this case, if I were to look on this page and I had a, a pretty good station for 20 meters, 14265, and I see there's M1JUR is uh, in New Hampshire, I tuned that frequency, 14265. If I can hear him calling, I call back and try to reach him. Thank you very much. Using that uh, spotting page is very helpful, and I'll focus on that. Does help. And if you get a chance to go out on winter field day, I'm sure you'll see it in action there. But you can do it from home or from the car, anywhere you go. Thank you very much. Oh, certainly. Thank you. Hey, Claude, I wanted to find out, can you use more than just the normal uh, bands for um, for POTA or like the work bands? Are those allowed? Well, parks and there it is. POTA is not a contest. Haven't we heard that before? But, you know, uh, back, to, oh, Michelle, one more quick answer to your question, you too, Chris. You want to make sure that when you're an activator, you stay on bands that people have access to. Even though I have an extra class license and I can operate on some segments of uh, 40 meters or 20 meters that a general class license they can't, uh, is unless I just don't want a lot of activity, I will make sure I stay in the general class portion of the bands. And especially 10 meters for technicians. Uh, if you're working phone, stay between 28.3, 28.5 to make sure that you you get the most business and, and the most enjoyment out of it too. But uh, warp bands, 12, 17, 30, 60, uh, yeah, they, they're wide open for us. But like any place, you want to make sure you're not interfering with somebody else's traffic. Uh, this is Michelle again. Are there any, um, maybe the top three bands, do you suggest that newbies uh, focus on when they're just starting out? What sunspot cycles change that uh, does affect it a little bit, but it, not a lot. My mm -hmm. general operating is what the 40 2017 inverted V dipole with links in it. And I have never gone on activation and failed activating on 40 meters, you know, to get 10 contact. Sometimes it's harder than others. Sometimes the, the conditions are better or worse, but 40 and 20 and lately 17 have been real killer bands for uh, operating. You can almost guarantee that you're going to make a contact, enough contacts on any of those. Thank you. Sure. Any uh, others? Uh, just Rob again, real fast. I remember reminded me. Um, yeah, I, uh, when you say it's not a contest, um, that, yeah, I've talked to people who talk to POTA stations, and they're always saying, you know, when they get somebody in a park, you're right, when they get someone in a park, they, they talk, they have conversations. It's not just, you know, give me the exchange and, and uh, then they go away and they want, you know, want the next call. Um, you're right, everybody's friendly. Yeah, some people are that way and some are not. It depends on the approach. I think though, if I tuned into a station and, and they were just blitzing out contacts, I'd try to stop a little, I mean, you know, not take too much time on it. And the other part is, how good is your connection? Sometimes we're straining on either side, hunter or activator, to, to understand the other person. But if it's a booming signal, like I'm working 40 meters, somebody 150 miles away, uh, Southern Tennessee, 
those signals are always way over S9. And we can carry on the conversation pretty easily. And some of the people's voices I recognize, man, we will talk for more than just the, the quick, you know, five, nine, kilo, two, two, zero, one, seven, three, and that's it. But you know, if, if somebody truly has a question and phrases it like, like the guy did that was telling me about the net, most activators will stop and talk if they have a little confidence. Of course, most activators aren't as, as busy at it as I am either. I understand that too. Any more questions? Uh, MZ Tuesday, you always have a question, don't you? Today? <laughs> have one today? No, I've, I've, I've been following it. Um, I've tried to activate uh, um, Kennesaw Mountain Park that I pass a couple of times a week, but I haven't, I don't spend enough time. It's just in between errands, but I really yeah. enjoy POTA and I jo enjoy the app. You know, the first time I activated Kennesaw was from the upper parking lot, the overflow parking lot, and it was snowing little speedy snow and uh, I quickly set up that dipole over the uh, wheel and turned the heater back on in the truck and got it warm turned it off and sat there nobody was there but that kind of tells me that you can activate HS in a valley I've done that at uh, DeSoto Falls which is definitely in a valley also a, it's a three for I'll get to that in just a minute but uh, more you can go to the top of the mountain, do VHF or anything you want to do there too. But it's fun. But everybody's got their own uh, uh, appreciation for radio and parks in there. I just, uh, uh, NZ2Z again, I just sit in the parking lot. And uh, if I have the small car, I'll just put, uh, have a tripod I put on top of the roof of yeah. the convertible and mm -hmm. operate uh, from inside the car. And if I'm in, a, if I have another car, I have a piece of long wire and a nine to one bailing and a tuner and I just throw it up in a tree and I got a chair and sit on the back of the Jeep and I just operate from there and I've done fairly well. You know, it's a great opportunity to try out your radio and, and different techniques like that. So I, I do appreciate it. Hey, John, uh, Rob, if you don't mind, let me move ahead real quick to some equipment pictures I got and pardon me if oh, I skip through these real fast. Go ahead. Okay, mobile and portable. Everybody, uh, this is one of Joe's slides here. And that's his wife there in the portable picture. <laughs> I don't. I, my car never looked like that on mobile, but the radio side anyway. But you can tell that a mobile is somebody that moves around. Portable, you can hike it in or whatever you want to do, or just set it to park bench. Uh, there's a mountain top or skip. You got one of those? I think you do. And. Uh, I will say that mine looks more like the one with the HT and the 7300 or whatever it is in the laptop there. There's a lot of different ways to, to do it. Um, see there's somebody's, maybe a 705, maybe Joe's right there, he does, he's got the label. And 817, those are five to 10 watt radios, QRP radios that are a lot more portable. Uh, the blue battery, that's, that's a dead giveaway for a bio-NO battery, which is a great thing to have. Um, different antennas, you see all sorts right there. Has a ballon right there. Um, battery by maybe Richard's cup. Richard's not on, is he? M1 RBD. There's Richard's picture. And uh, that's just some of the stuff that you see. There's my picture. That's uh, one of the lake, Chris, you may recognize that lake. I can't remember, maybe Paradise. And the bottom left picture is that Sapelo Island. They threw me out under a pavilion there and left me for an hour and a half on the beach side. It was really terrible, wasn't it? That was nice. The latest one that was really unusual to me, and I got to say this, was I went to Wolf Island, my friend down at Darien. We went out there in a 17-foot Boston Whaler. I stopped by the truck stop before I got there because I needed a clamp to clamp my uh, vertical antenna to the handrail on the side of his boat. Wolf Island is uh, restricted from uh, human contact, but you can get into salt creeks that are within the boundaries of the island. And I, I clamped that uh, antenna to the uh, rail, tried to figure out what to do with the counterpoint, and I realized, well, look, there's salt water in this creek. Throw the wires down there. So I put three counterpoise wires in there. 
And before you know it, about an hour later or less, 100 contacts were done. Um, so that's pretty much it. Anybody else got any questions? I'm, I'm good with that. Anyone, anyone? The 705 is a, that's a QRP radio, right? It's a ICOM's newest, fanciest uh, QRP radio. It runs five watts with a battery pack that's like HT or 10 watts with an external battery pack. Um, the picture I've got on the picnic table there is a Elecraft KX2 that runs uh, up to 10 watts with this internal battery and you can see the little blue battery pack so I was wanting to run a, I couldn't run any more power but it just runs longer on that one and I could talk for a long time and now this is a good chance to remember the tech fest coming up on the 14th uh, I'll be sitting at a table for a good while out there and then we'll have a, a forum session too you may see a lot of the same slides again uh, Bill, you know, uh, Arnold KC4ZUA will be there and he's going to be talking about hammers. But I got plenty of stories to tell about this and be glad to help anybody. It, it encourages me to see people get involved with parks and names. Arnold's going to be talking about ha hammers? <laughs> Hammer? Well, anything. Well, <laughs> he is that character. But yeah, he's going to be talking about doing logging on uh, using the hammers program. And I haven't used hammer. I didn't use a uh, in 3 HAP, but there's a lot of different ways you can log too. Arnold, yeah, Arnold's a very, you know, he's always talking up uh, Poda. He has a great time on there. Oh, yeah. He was down at uh, uh, Clybo Range and uh, Charlie Ellett and then Marvin Farm. You know, that's something I probably need to mention. That Those three, the state map manager can't figure out which one's which down there, and neither can the state uh, wildlife resource division. So those count as three parks at once. So you get to call, I'm at a threefer, or there's a twofer, actually uh, Panola Mountains within Arabia Mountain National Heritage Area. That counts as a, a double park too. And there's a couple of others like that. I mentioned the Soto Falls, which is inside the uh, Chattahoochee National Forest. And it's also within a hundred feet of, uh, no, it's within a WMA of the state. And it, you know, so it, there's some of those combinations you have to work on too. So that's kind of advanced knowledge, but I'll be glad to go over that on the 14th if you stop by and see me. Yeah, little Okamogie down in Dodge County. Yeah. Alaska County. Yeah. What time yeah, is your uh, presentation at, uh, at Tech Fest? Well, presentation is late. I think it's two o'clock, but I, we also will have a table set up to just to do casual conversation out there too. Maybe have a little uh, show and tell about equipment too. You may answer questions. So that'll be I'm almost all day. It's a great opportunity for uh yeah for follow up. Yeah, glad to. I wish I could make it over for you winter field day at uh Sweetwater, but I'll be at Watson Mill Bridge uh two days over there. We just hope we can make contact from part to part. See if you can make it to the Atlanta Ham Fest in 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 June. We'll talk about that. <laughs> uh, you know, I thought about that, but uh I'm uh, working on getting back to Osabo Island. There's some people didn't make contact when I went down there. So me, I'm, I'm kind of working on that one, John. Or Rob. Okay. Well, with that, I'm, I will stop sharing and get back to the meeting. I appreciate you letting me do this. Yay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Claude. Appreciate that. Thanks for, and thanks for stepping in. At the uh, at the last minute to bail me out. Tell everybody, right? <laughs> so somebody tell me how to get out of this. Now I'll be all right. I'm trying to find the button to. Yeah, I think I got it up there, but let's see. Oh, there we go. 73, see you the 14th. All right, I'll be here if you don't mind staying around. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, uh, thanks Rob, thanks Claude. Uh, another great another great program for tonight. Uh, we, uh, for those of you that stick around for the rest of this meeting, we, uh, we're always looking for uh, 
things to, for the club to do, which obviously includes programs on uh, once a month for our monthly meetings. So like I said earlier, if you were, you may not have been with us, uh, please do let us know if there's something of interest that you'd like to see Rob try to um, put together for a monthly uh, club form for our Thursday night meetings, always the first Thursday of uh, the month. In case you don't know, we'll, we'll, we'll be uh, at some point here shortly, we'll be back to in-person uh, meetings that uh, we're working on that. And Zoom has uh, afforded us uh, the opportunity to at least keep meeting um, officially as a club. So, but nothing, uh, nothing substitutes the in-person uh, camaraderie of a club. So we're working on getting back to that uh, in the next two months here, uh, hopefully February. Uh, anyways, uh, Rob had uh, talked, uh, mentioned about uh, asking about uh, ideas. Um, we do have a, an informal uh, calendar of some ideas of things that we're looking at uh, doing. Um, we're always looking to add things to this. We're going to get this thing formalized here in the next couple of weeks and post it on the website so that you can put it on the calendar for the rest of the year. Let me see if I can I was trying to find it earlier while the presentation was going on. Uh, I missed Rob's email. Uh, let's see. Just so you can look at it, if I can figure out how to do this. There it is. All right. So this is just a rundown of the rest of the year of some ideas of things that we're still working to solidify. But uh, of course, January is a busy month. I'm assuming y'all can see the the uh, notepad in front of you. See now. All right. So of course, this month we had a uh, full month. Uh, we've got Text Fest next weekend. Uh, this weekend, we've got Sunday in the park, uh, the 8th at Brook Run, which like I said, uh, for those of you who don't know, we basically just uh, Brook Run's been our go-to park recently, so um, we've also done Blackburn Park inside the perimeter near uh, Perimeter Mall and some other parks. Uh, we're still looking, uh, scouting other parks for places inside the perimeter we can do this, but Brook Run is where we're going to be this weekend on Sunday from uh, 1 to 5. We'll have radio set out, and the idea is just to get everybody to come out, and um, hopefully we can work away your mic fright if you have it, or if you have... Uh, uh, questions about how to hook something up or or whatever bring it with you if you want to try it out we'll, we'll, we've got some uh, we got one of the best antenna guy gurus in the state uh, in the country uh, Bill Perkins seems to always have an answer to whatever possible question you could have about why your antenna doesn't work uh, so bring it along with you we'll string it up in the tree and we'll get it working for you at least worst case we'll tell you it just doesn't work throw it away but uh, anyway so um, hey, John. Hey, John. Go ahead. Um, for your April schedule, um, you know, uh, Claude mentioned the uh, the Georgia State Parks weekend, April 1st and 2nd, you know, where we're going to try to have people fan out across the state and activate all 50 parks in one weekend. There is a category for clubs to activate. So, yeah, um, it's uh, it's we're going to talk about it. We um, most certainly, I think that's something we're going to be able to do. Um, I did see that. So we're, we're aware that uh, we'll, we'll come up with something uh, to um, participate as a club, I guess, in that event. So the, some of these don't have dates in front of them. Uh, I couldn't find the actual email that I had that I'd emailed the file. I couldn't even find the file, but I had to pull this out of an old email real quick. So it's missing some of the dates. So that's uh, the first weekend in April, but uh, we'll get to that. We'll get to that in a second. But anyways, um, thanks, Skip. Of course, Tech Fest is next week, next weekend, and then Winterfield Day at the end of the month. We'll be out at Sweetwater Creek, and like Claude said, that's a uh, Poda Park also. So the band should be hopping that weekend. Um, whether you're a tech or general or extra, there's somewhere that you can operate on your own, and, or under the supervision of a general or extra if you're tech so do join us for that and that's an overnighter like i said weather shouldn't be an issue because we're going to be utilizing yurts uh this year we tried to we talked about getting back to our old second sunday it used to be a um we used to do tech sessions at the uh, peace Treaty cab airport and that was our second sunday stuff 
Um, and then a while back, we started to, the, the tech sessions kind of went away and we started doing a Sunday in the park, second Sunday, uh, where we'd show up at a park like we do and set the radios out and go at it. So we want to try to get back to having that on the calendar, just like our meetings are on the first Thursday of the month and so on and so forth, so that you know we're going to be doing something on the second Sunday. There are a few anomalies. Uh, Mother's Day is always an issue. So we typically will do that on the Saturday before uh, of Mother's Day weekend so that you can be with mom on Sunday. Um, and that'll be listed on the counter when we put it out, something like that. So um, not a whole lot going on in February. There is our second Sunday, I believe, was going to be the third Sunday, just because several of us are going to be down that, that put all these together are going to be down at Hamcation. So we uh, we usually move that back a week. Uh, so the second Sunday will be on third Sunday that month. Uh, you'll see in March, we uh, Tom Crowley, uh, I'm drawing a blank on his call sign at the moment. Uh, he's into uh, astronomy and radio astronomy and all that. So uh, he brought to our attention the Pisgah Astronomical Research Center in Asheville. And um, so we're gonna try to schedule something for uh, March for that. Um, he suggested we not do it any earlier than March because of the weather, uh, which makes sense. So March, possibly April or May, it just depends on where we end up putting it on the calendar, but probably March, we'll do a um, field trip. So uh, I know not everybody can necessarily drive. So what we'll do is we'll arrange to um, maybe meet downtown at the Red Cross or something and carpool from there for those who can't necessarily make the drive themselves for whatever reason. Um, and uh, we can uh, go up and see that. Uh, if you haven't had a chance, if you don't know what that's about, you can Google that and uh, read about the, the research center up there. And then um, I know it says Asheville Antique Radio Museum. We thought that was just something we kind of threw in there also. It's probably too much to do in one trip, so just ignore that. We can do that on another field trip where we call ahead and go up and see the Asheville Antique Radio Museum, which is in the same general area. Um, we just need to schedule that in advance with them for a group. And then, of course, you've got the second Sunday in the parks. Uh, April's busy. You've got the uh, Georgia Poto Parks event uh, the first weekend. And then you've got the Georgia CUSO party the 8th and the 9th. I believe I've got those dates right. We typically will do just a one day event uh, out at Brook Run is where we've done it the last two years. And we typically do it on uh, Saturday as a, as a club. And then there's also a POTA Par uh, Support Your Parks Weekend that month that we might be able to throw in as an additional um, an event. So that doesn't have a date. Uh, there is a date officially on that. I just don't have it on this uh, list, but we'll get that as an optional thing to do. Um, second Sunday, of course, May. Um, like I said, um, it's, bad. it's on Saturday instead of Sunday because of Mother's Day. Uh, we've talked about doing the strange antenna challenge the last couple of years. Um, I'd like to really see us do that. We've got time right now to plan for that. We'll get it on the calendar. And uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the strange antenna challenge. Uh, um, Bill might be able to, if he's still around, might be able to give us a little more history on it. But basically, it's basically what it says. It's, uh, it's coming up with a strange antenna. And we've had, for examples, I wish I had some pictures, but we've had We've had people wire up a bicycle. We've had people wire up a set of crutches and make a dipole out of a set of crutches hanging off of a post. We've had the uh, the Coke can antennas that you, the coffee can antennas that you see. Um, well, there's been all kinds of- We had uh, Arnold and, and his ladder. Oh, that's right. The, 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 the ladder, the extending ladder, the, the, the old extending ladder, um, Arnold uh, K4's, uh, KC4ZUA, uh, was known for that uh, wiring up uh, uh, an extension ladder. Rob still had the best one. He he's the one that did the saltwater antenna. That's right. Uh, it was supposed to be twenty meters, but it turned out being two. And we checked into the Sunday night net on a saltwater antenna. We did. Well, I couldn't be near the saltwater, you know, in the ocean, so I had to bring the saltwater with me. That's right. So the the idea is to. Uh, uh, Bill, you got any more history on that event? When, how it came about, or where? I know it seemed like it was. I don't know how, if it's still an actual event or not, or did it go? By it, it started out as a gimmick, more or less, by two guys out in Missouri, and it kind of caught the attention of, and I can't remember his name, but he was in New Mexico, 
and then Arnold sort of picked it up and we had the first local event here in my backyard and then it kind of grew I think the last one we did we had about 50 or 60 people out there um, hams and spouses and everybody you could think of on a nasty rainy afternoon but the history of it was it just started out as a gimmick and people got interested and you got a couple of spark plugs like Arnold pushing on it and talking about it and it took off. And then one of the guys basically sort of quit and they quit updating the website and it's kind of faded a little bit. But there, if you watch the ARRL database, there will be a lot of K something S stations pop up on that weekend, Strange Antenna Challenge. Okay. So it, then, like I said, it's exactly how it's it's strange. So come up with something strange. You've got, we've got time to plan for it. We can do some antennas as a group, or you can, you know, if you if you've got something strange already put together that you want to bring out, and um, by all means bring it. But uh, we'll uh, we'll keep this going so that we've got time to. Uh, we're not rushing at the last second trying to put together strange antennas, but um, it's a I'm lot of fun. I'm going to try the bicycle again. I did it once and, you know, it tuned up good in the yard when I was hanging it out of the dogwood tree. But then when I hung it on a rope out of a pine tree, it seemed like it didn't tune as well. So I'm going to try the bicycle vertical again, for sure. Do you still have, do Bill, you still have that UDY, UDY's antenna? Uh, I have the components to it. The last time we took it out, I believe it was over at, um, mike ehm's house and he had been gone at that point i believe 10 years and we sort of said this will be the last appearance of it but yeah i still have all the parts it's just no longer assembled that was pretty neat it was a it was a home, it wasn't a tower, but it was something what, what would you call it a homebrew step ir So anyways, it, you know, it's, it's, there's some crazy stuff out there that people manage to uh, put a wire to and make uh resonant. So they, um, I'm sure you can probably go out on the internet and search YouTube and other places and find plenty of examples. Um, probably quite a few from people right here in Atlanta that have done it. Um, so keep that in mind and uh, we'll, uh, we'll get this nailed down here shortly and then we'll start uh, uh, reminding you uh, about all these coming up and when what's involved in them. So the strange antenna challenge is something, like I said, you may already have done this before or have something in mind that you just want to try that you don't even know if it'll work. Um, sometimes strange things happen and strange things work and sometimes they don't, but you still have fun trying. So that's kind of the, the challenge. And I know there seems like in January, I was talking about this the other night, there's actually a uh light bulb antenna challenge of some sort where they where they uh use light bulbs to create antennas uh, of course we've got uh, the ham fest uh the first weekend in june coming up uh that's always uh, a big need of volunteers there if you'd like to be interested in the pre-planning on that uh the more the merrier it'd be great uh, let let me know contact one of us on the board uh, and we'll find you a task uh, to help us get the ham fest um, to its June uh, 3rd date this year. This will be the 91st date, I guess, first event that we've had. Um, it's um, been a little bit of a challenge putting on a ham fest the last couple of years because of COVID. And it's becoming more of a challenge as some of these clubs uh, are starting to age out, getting people to volunteer. So seriously consider... Uh, uh, letting us know that you'd be uh, uh, willing to volunteer and the sooner the better so that we can find a task for you to help us uh, make this a success. It's, uh, it's been, like I said, it's been going on 90, 90 events so far um, since its inception. Of course, if you don't know the history of a ham fest, uh, we've actually got one or two photos from back in the early 30s, I believe. A ham fest back then was just hiking to the top of Stone Mountain with about 40 guys that were Atlanta area hams and they, it was more of just a social event. Then now, of course, it's vendors and all kinds of stuff. So um, it's, uh, it's uh, grown in history over the years of what kind of, a, what, what a ham fest actually is. And it's pretty fascinating to see photos when you can find them. Um, 
second Sunday in June. Of course, uh, I believe that's the same weekend as the uh, June ARRL VHF contest. So it gives us plenty of opportunities to have a successful event and make a lot of contacts. And then of course the ARRL field day is at the end of that month. Uh, if uh, I would imagine if all goes well with uh, the winter field day being a two day event, we'll, uh, we'll definitely make uh, the summer event two days. Uh, it's a lot warmer, of course, so uh, people can come out and not have to worry about freezing their buns off. So um, I think I've got, we'll have all these dates attached to the calendar. So um, then of course, July, um, more second Sunday in the park activity. Uh, there's a park, uh, I think July is the one that has the <clears throat> annual support your park event, annual plaque event. And that's the, is that the set? Maybe the second Sunday anyways. Uh, that would be an opportunity for us to operate that event as a club and uh, have a lot of fun with that. And then of course, uh, August and uh, is another second Sunday type event. So there's plenty of other uh, opportunities for you to suggest things uh, for us to do, uh, whether it's operating radios or uh, taking a field trip. I mean, we've had all kinds of things like um, even making a field trip out to MF, this was years ago, but making a field trip out to MFJ uh, via bus or something. Um, so, I mean, if somebody really came up and wanted to do a Field trip, field trip to Connecticut and visit 1WAW, by all means, suggest it. And I guess if we can put it together and make it happen, why not? Um, we're not opposed to uh, doing whatever it is you think uh, we could have fun doing. So, uh, but definitely put uh, second Sundays on your calendars as operating events with the occasional anomaly, like I said, May being Mother's Day. So that would be on Saturday. Uh, does anybody have any, um, that just gets us to August and that's when the new board takes over. So we kind of just, after that, it, you get into the holidays anyway. So um, we kind of stopped for August for the moment. Uh, by the time we get towards that part of the year, I'm sure we'll we'll come up with more stuff for the new board to uh, take on as suggestions. Does anybody have any, uh, immediately have any ideas of some things that they've seen before or thought of that they'd like to see us do or go to or or put on or whatever yeah john i have several issues uh, <clears throat> uh count me in for the uh, ham fest uh, okay. i'll be glad to help and uh last night i made my reservations for the um, huntsville um ham fest that uh, qso party is the same weekend and I found a pretty good rate, $98 a night at Town Place Suites by Marriott in Huntsville. It's um, off of University Drive. It's right around the corner from that German restaurant that we ate at. Okay. And so you know, if you get your reservations early, you'll probably get a good rate. Yeah, I'm, I, and I'm sorry, I, that's, I, for some reason, that it, it's not on the calendar here, but that's, we, we, we had talked about making that a trip this past year, and, it, and we, it just didn't. It didn't come to fruition. So if by all means, if enough people want to put something together where we, you know, even have to carpool together, if somebody can't make the ride by themselves and needs to carpool, we can talk about it and we can make that a field trip too. If everybody, if enough people want to, uh, to uh, we've been having a ham fest table over there and promoting both the club and the ham fest. So we certainly could make that a field trip and uh, heck we could probably find an Airbnb that has eight bedrooms or something if we wanted to and tried to, fill that up with enough of us. So certainly a good idea. Any other, any, what, what else, Ed? Yeah, uh, one more thing, and this is pretty far out. On, um, uh, on April the 8th, 2024, the last total solar eclipse for the, for the next 20 years will occur. And so I plan on being in Hot Springs, Arkansas on that day to view this total solar eclipse. You know, that's pretty far out, but uh, we might want to think about that. Sure, sure. That's that's something to something to put on the planning for next year. That's 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 a good idea. What last, else? Um, the last eclipse didn't that happen? I think it was in August, right? Because we had some guys who went to Huntsville that weekend, and then from Huntsville they went up to I think Tennessee for the yeah. For the yeah, summer. it was 2017. I went to uh, South Carolina to see it, uh, where um, Plumston University is. It, it occurred there. 
but you got to go a little further this for the 2024 event. We should they find come, out if propagation changes when you're in the middle of a when you're in the middle of, a, of an eclipse because the sun temporarily stops lighting up the atmosphere. It's pretty strange um, because when you're in the middle of the eclipse, everything is dark and all the animals think it's nighttime. So the crickets start, start chirping. All these animals start making noise. Also, all these, uh, the lights at the hotel and the restaurants around started coming on because they're on, um, on um, light sensors. It's it was pretty cool. That's all I got, John. Okay. John, let me ask, uh, where is this going to be posted? Because it should be on the, I mean, it'll be on the, the web page, but where oh, else? Oh, yeah. This we'll, we'll put on the web page and we'll continue to, uh, uh, we'll find ways to uh, advertise it through the groups.io and and also uh, Facebook. Um, I'll have to look at Facebook and see what kind of calendar feature there might be that automatically kind of puts things out and lets people know things. If not, we have to manually do it, I guess, but uh, sort of like we've been doing with the second Sunday stuff, but uh, it'll definitely be on the website, the, the Atlanta Radio Club org. Yeah, and there's a calendar in, uh, in groups.io that you can look at by going to groups.io yeah. or if you have your own calendar like Outlook, you can automatically pull the events from uh, from that calendar into your personal calendar and keep up with it that way yeah we just um yeah we put it on the calendar and and definitely the groups.io that's, that's a good way that it'll populate your calendar if you've got everything set up correctly um if you're not sure how to do that i'm sure we can talk you through how, how you uh, get that kind of stuff to populate your google's calendar or, or whatever program you use so whatever apparatus or vehicle um, of course, this list, like I said, is not, I mean, it's not the end all list. We, um, it's just the things that, like I said, the second Sunday stuff, the ham fest, the QSO parties, things like that, that we know we're going to do. And if, if you like several of us, we just, we, it's fun to throw the radios out in the park and it's not to say there wouldn't be optional things that we recognize that say, Hey, let's, you know, the, um, the club's more than willing to make things happen. So if you, if there's something like I said, I'm not afraid to steal what other clubs are doing. If there's something that another club's done, by all means, uh, if it's good enough for you to, to uh, mention, it must be good enough for us to do. So uh, we'll certainly look into it and see how it fits into the calendar and add it on if we need to. So there, there, there always is the chance of a last minute opportunity to do something that we might throw out there also. We just need your input. And, suggestions things you want to what do you, you know what are you interested in i mean there's we did a net one night sunday night net and apparently a lot of people on the net that night were into motorcycles uh so you know it doesn't even have to be a, a radio related thing apparently uh the question something about i forget what it was it was about what do you do other than things that you're into other than ham radio and the motorcycle world seemed to light up that night and so someone suggested let's take a trip over to the motor Michael, motorcycle museum over in Birmingham or Huntsville or wherever it was. And so I was like, sure, if that's, you know, if somebody wants to, you know, give us details, we can, and if enough people want to do it, why not? It's a, you know, there's, this club's very social. So if it's an opportunity for us to get together and do something social, it doesn't have to, you know, we can take radios with us and go to the museum and then go throw, throw the radios and antennas up in the trees in the park for, nearby for a couple hours before we go back home. So, uh, by all means, it doesn't have to necessarily be totally uh, amateur radio related. Let me add a couple of things to uh, to this. We've got our weekly lunches on Friday at yeah. the Miller Mushroom in Brookhaven, um, twelve thirty every Friday, and uh, they're fun. We're getting more people showing up. We're getting new people, such as Michelle there, and we we got a good group and. Everyone's welcome. You're in the club. You're not in the club. Whatever. Come on by. It's always um, there's always fun stuff going on over there. It's it's they're uh, they're enjoyable. So that's every every Friday. And since we don't meet 
you know, in person every month that that's sort of like our, our club meetings. <laughs> that's really, other than the outdoor activities, that's the only place where we're getting together face to face. So Brookhaven, um, Mellow Mushroom, across the street from the motor station every Friday at, uh, at 1230. And then one more thing for the second Sunday, every second Sunday of the, uh, every second Sunday, the ARC and uh, Laurel Amateur Radio Club sponsors free uh, license testing at PDK Airport every, uh, again, the second Sunday. You can uh, um, upgrade new licenses. It's all, the tests are all free. In fact, when what we've done is somebody took a tech test and they, they, uh, they didn't pass. And we said, hey, it's all free. You know, you just want to try a different uh, test. And, and, and they did and they, and they passed. Or if they get, you know, go to general, say, hey, you want to try extra. I mean, it's all, again, it's all free. And um, um, that'll, that's every, every Sunday at the park. Um, I mean, I'm sorry, every Sunday at PDK Airport um, at noon, at noon before our uh, normal second Sunday events. And all, that in, all that's on the website. Um, it's probably already, you know, because we post on the website, groups.io and uh, Facebook. So all that's there. And uh, one more, th the video from, from tonight, the video of this, uh, of our meeting tonight is going to be on, uh, it'll be on YouTube by, by the weekend. We've got videos from all of our meetings since um, August 2020 up on YouTube. So if you miss the meeting or you want to see something again, um, you know, you're welcome to look at YouTube. And again, it's on the website if you want to see um, where it is. So uh, back, and we've got notes from the from there too, some of the presentations on there. So anyway, uh, sit for me. Okay, okay for you, all right, back to back to net, back to president. And and, and by all means, uh, join us for lunch if you can. We're we're I'm I, I really want to try to get a, a a couple Saturday breakfasts going over this year, maybe, because I know not and everybody is not retired. So getting there on Friday is probably a little difficult for, for some. So uh, we're going to try to mix in a, a breakfast here and there just to give you a chance to come out and, and rub elbows with fellow club members uh, at a breakfast, uh, you know, at a bagel shop or whatever. Nothing, nothing expensive or extravagant. Um, you know, recently, uh, it was the uh, last was I guess it was last week um, at the Mellow Mushroom. We had a little power pole building session breakout. It was probably a little pre-planned, but that's those those uh, those lunches and breakfasts are great opportunities for that kind of stuff to uh, for you to bring uh, you know bring bring your latest project or something maybe you're working on even if it's not finished just bring it with you and we've uh, we've had that kind of stuff thrown out on the table for everybody to kind of look at and ask questions about and um so those are good opportunities for for the club to you know get together socially and and not necessarily operate radios but just see what other guys are doing in the club or or gals too i'm sorry <laughs> john um and rob uh we ran into something sunday we've talked about poda tonight but apparently arrl has something called vota v-o-t-a volunteers on the air and i thought i received a uh email from arrl about it but that email has disappeared i was wondering if anybody else had heard about it or if it was of interest to anybody I hadn't. I know there was something in the QST this month about volunteerism, but I don't know if there was information in there or not. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd have to go find the magazine to pull it up, but I haven't heard anything. Yeah, that's interesting. I'll look for that on the on the website. I'm curious. I'm curious about that. Right, because I think there was one lady who was giving out 175 points on Sunday, and um, <laughs> we didn't know quite what it was all about. I still want to do Waffle House on the air. Yeah, Woda. <laughs> well, there's your breakfast on Saturday morning. There you go. That's true. <laughs> and that was a superb program on the power pole too. Many, many thanks to Bill for that. Yeah, that was a lot. Of, that was a lot of fun. Any other ideas, suggestions, comments? All right. I know we've. Uh, 
uh, Skip and his crew, Skip had a few guys either working with and they've uh, kind of come up with some ideas on how the club can, can work on uh, um, membership, uh, growing membership and stuff like that, that the board's uh, taking a look at to see uh, um, what kind of information they've come up with for us as far as mapping where our, our membership is and uh, where to focus our efforts. We, uh, we've been working on, uh, we send some letters out from time to time. Uh, sometimes we try to do it in conjunction with an event coming up so that we can welcome New Hams in particular um, or somebody who may have upgraded recently that's within the certain footprint that we've been working on uh, or focusing on and invite them out to uh, the club and events that we're doing. Um, we've gained a few people that way, so I, it's, it's been successful. Um, we know Atlanta is a very difficult city to get people involved in because there's so many things, so many op other opportunities or things to do that there are a lot of people that have gotten their licenses within the perimeter itself and are just not into the club scene, um, whether it's ham radio or dancing or whatever. But um, what we're working on, uh, we're working on ways to uh, to invite new hams into the hobby here in Atlanta and the Atlanta Radio Club and um, looking at ways that we can interface and um, coordinate or, or uh, enjoy the camaraderie of some of the other clubs here in town. I've noticed recently that there's been a shift in um, over the past year or two, how the clubs uh, kind of work together a little better than they have in the past. And uh, so that's, that's good to see. And it's always fun when you can have multiple clubs uh, getting together, doing things. Uh, for the benefit of the hobby. So, um, any other ideas? Any any suggestions? After tonight, if if you think of something or you see something, please do write it down and and either email it to us or um, you can make a suggestion on the Sunday night net at eight o'clock when we do our Sunday night net. Um, the good thing about the Sunday night net is you don't have to uh, have a radio. You can hop on Echo Link. Um, if you have an interest in operating, being a net control operator for the net, it's real simple. There's a script. Um, and honestly, if you make a mistake, nobody's going to notice anyway. So there's a lot of hams that get their licenses and they have mic fright and they never literally never get on the radio. Um, I want you to know that it doesn't, I mean, even the best of us are going to make mistakes, but I mean, it's, it's, it's not like we're breaking the law or something like that. See, if you, if you say the wrong thing, no big deal, just keep on going, but just the script's there for you to read and it's pretty simple to follow. And uh, we come up with a question and you certainly can, if it's your night to do it, you can turn it into a tech net if you want and, you know, put something out there and turn it into a question and answer session. If you'd like it's, it's not, uh, nothing's written in stone. But uh, do consider participating in that too. And like I said, you don't have to have a radio. If you got a smartphone with uh, Echo Link capability, which most of us do, uh, you can even run the net from there. That's what I've been doing for the last several months. So, as a net control op, it's uh, uh, gets a little get it's a little getting used to because there's a little bit of a of a lag time in it. But uh, it's it's easy to do. So that's another opportunity to participate. Any other any other suggestions ideas? Like I said, we're working on getting back to an in-person thing. So we're looking at some sites. Um, it's not that, I mean, it's not to say we won't be at Red Cross at some point, but it's a little difficult at the moment because they uh, have changed to a uh, format where they no longer have a security guard at the door. So unless we've got somebody um, who has access and then basically you have to be a volunteer to do that. Um, and we've only got one person right now that has that ability, so it makes it a little difficult if they're out of town for us to have access to the building. So that's kind of our challenge with the Red Cross right now. Other than that, it's not a bad place to meet. It's it's I know it's downtown, and so it's a little more center center town for everybody. Uh, like I said, a good bit of our membership is from center of town north to the perimeter. Uh, but uh, the Red Cross is free and has a, a slew of audio and visual uh items that we can use to enhance our meetings so um but for the time being we may end up you may end up seeing us doing an in-person meeting somewhere at a church or a library or um even at a restaurant 
Mike Lozano and he and I were talking today. The club meets at Mellow Mushroom every Friday and there's that back room. There's always a possibility we could do it there too. Uh, we wouldn't have as easy of a time using the Zoom feature for that, but um, was there, there's ways to make any particular location work. So they all have their challenges and they all have their benefits. Mellow Mushroom has food, so we can eat and then, then meet, so. Um, does a uh, real quick question, well, it, I, I was interested to know how many of y'all, you get your information on club events. Do you do groups.io um, and do you use the individual email feature or do you do a, a um, uh, what's it called? I'm drawing blanks. Anyways, where they send it to y'all in one thing and then you never open it up and look. So we're trying to, we're trying to find the best way to um, get the information to everybody. So um, if, uh, if you have a problem getting calendar information in particular activities and events, events, please do let us know. Say, hey, I don't, I don't have email or I don't have a smartphone or whatever. Just something, you know, tell us what's the best way to um, reach out to you. Um, so that we can try to make sure that you see what's going, what activities are coming up and, and, and get the information. Um, I know with all the group, the .io groups I belong to, a lot of them, unfortunately, I, they come to me in, in a log of emails and I don't get a chance to really look to them all. And I, I hope we're not missing out on people participating simply because of that. So, you know, if you have a problem getting information from us, please do let us know what works best for you just by, you know, let, emailing us or whatever, let us know so that we can try to tailor our delivery of our information to you so that you get it. Um, anybody else on the board have any uh, questions, suggestions or anything, anything they have to contribute at this time? Quiet. All right, and of course, if, you, uh, if you're a dues paying member, which I hope all of you are, of course, we don't have a once a year type system. We have it uh, right now, it's on the however you join type system. So if you're not sure, uh, obviously uh, dues go a long way to helping us support our repeaters and, and our club activities. So if you're uh, looking to know, if you're not sure if you're a current member or not, you can certainly contact uh, Aid, uh, our secretary and all of our emails are simple. It's whatever position. So for aid, it'd be secretary at atlantaradioclub.org. Um, mine's president at uh, Bill Perkins is, oh boy, is it vice president or VP? Uh, we'll have to check that one out. Um, or you can do an XCOM at atlantaradioclub.org and we'll all, we'll all see the email. So um, let us know and shoot us emails and let us know what we need to do to make, uh, make, uh, the club work for you and, and make it a, a, an experience that you want to participate in. And like I said, if you want to know if you're a current member or not, uh, contact aid at secretary at Atlanta Radio Club org and ask him. He can let you know if you're current or not. And of course, if you're planning on passing away in the next few days, don't forget to include us in your will, of course. Uh, we're always looking for whatever avenues we can to help uh, uh, support things that the club's doing. Um, any other uh, questions, comments, suggestions from anybody? Do we have a, we don't have, I guess we don't have a program for next month yet, do we, Merle? You're still on mute. Yeah, you're on mute, Rob. Ours has there. I do not. Okay. I will do well, that. We'll, um, We'll see how fair, we'll let you know about February. Just stay tuned for that. Um, it may just be an in-person meeting where we do something and it's not a Zoom related type thing. So just keep your eye out on, on uh, the different avenues that we, uh, website.io group or Facebook. We'll let you know what February is looking like. All right, uh, it's about 9.15. Any, any, anybody have any other questions, uh, comments, suggestions, ideas? Like I said, if not, uh, for, don't forget uh, Sunday, uh, 1 to 5 p.m. at Brook Run Park. Uh, we're back in the back near the back entrance off of Peeler. If you come through the park, 
you'll hit a stop sign at uh, the main drag there, and I believe it's to Cab Way. And if you turn right there, the treetop quest is over to the left, and we're going to be up on the hill there. Um, there's limited parking near the treetop, but then you've got that big parking lot right back behind you to the right. Uh, so please do join us for that. Like I said, if you don't have a radio, certainly come on out anyways. We've got uh, we've got radio set up, and uh, if you want to get on the air, this is a good chance if you're someone who doesn't have one or has would like to try you know, there's there there may be a radio sitting there that you uh, have an interest in and and would like to uh, purchase one like that. So it's a good chance to try something out and see what works for you. And then of course this month I forgot to mention it. This month the entire month is Winter Heat, which is an event that uh, started up in Illinois and it's a simplex event. You can go to uh, www.hamactive.com to register. And basically, you uh, there'll be some simplex frequencies that they suggest uh, that they don't want you on the uh, national calling frequencies to clog that up. So they've got some suggested frequencies. Um, and the idea is to test out your uh, simplex abilities uh, and make contacts. And you've got a slick little logging program that'll that'll map out your contact, and you can see who who else around the country that's participating is where their contacts are. And it's a neat little thing. There's, there's, I think there's, I think there's 40 people here in Georgia that have signed up now this, as of this week um, to participate, which we only had seven or eight last year, I think. Um, and like I said, it's just an opportunity to text out your uh, simplex stuff and it's all, all uh, on two meters and 440 and it's, it's all month long. So it's a, it's a neat thing. So check that out and get on and give it a shout. Uh, if anything else, if nothing else, I guess we'll call it quits for the night, and uh, hopefully you'll join us on Sunday. If not, join us uh, at the Tech Fest or at Winter Field Day at the end of the month, and then, of course, uh, Sunday nights and uh, next, uh, the first Thursday of next month, we'll have something. We'll let you know. Anything else? All right, well. Thanks for joining us tonight. And thanks, Rob, for another great program. Thanks, Claude. I don't know if Claude's still with us, but uh, thanks. And um, look forward to uh, hearing you on the air. Everybody have a good evening, and we'll uh, we'll talk at you later. Thanks, John. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Michelle. <laughs> thanks, everyone. See you next time, tomorrow, whenever. The 14th, at least. Tech Fest is always fun. Yes. I'll just leave this up if any, anybody anybody left wants to chat y'all more than more than happy to I'll leave this up and y'all can chat for a while. <laughs>